Well, it's been so long since I have been in Colossians, and I don't think I can finish Colossians in the next two weeks, so I've decided to do another sermon. Um, I decided to pick a couple that I uh, really feel strongly about and uh, hope they're a blessing to you, but here, here is my uh, one fear. Um, I forgot if I have preached it here before, <laughs> so if I start looking like y'all are mouthing my words, I'm going to switch to another one or something, so... Um, I guess uh, the last church where I was interim was uh, Lakeside Baptist Church in uh, Dallas. And I got to do the book of Hebrews for them. Uh, it had been a while since I had worked through Hebrews verse by verse. It's, uh, I think it's one of the best commentaries. Well, I think it is the best New Testament commentary on the Old Testament. Um, it gives a perspective on how we f- should view the Old Testament. I have been, uh, I'm, I'm currently working on a, a, co- a commentary to finishing Isaiah. I'm doing Isaiah 40 through 66. I'm on, I'm on chapter 58 this week. And uh, some of the promises that God makes to Israel in chapter 58 are just astonishing. It's, it's like, as I made a promise not to destroy the world by water through Noah, I'll make it a promise not to take you out of the land anymore, not to let your enemies be defeated. But unfortunately, as you know, history, uh, they were defeated again. And you just wonder, what what should I do with promises like that? Promises that are so powerful. Well, what, what we have to do, what we have to do, and it's so uncomfortable to do it. What we have to do is reinterpret those promises in light of the new covenant, in light, in light of the new age. And I think that Hebrews does that. And uh, tonight I would like to deal with just the first couple of verses out of Hebrews, which I think sets the stage. And um, I, I have struggled uh, with you some on this very issue. And that is the issue of how do we, how do we view the Old Covenant and New Covenant? How, how do we relate them? Uh, how do we take the promises of, of, of the New Covenant and relate them to national Israel? And, and I hope if you are in the position for a new um, a daily devotional time, a new book to read through, I, I really challenge you to think about Hebrews. Uh, it, it, will be, it will be a tough book for you because uh, Hebrews is written in rabbinical ways and not in ways that you are used to in the New Testament. But I think it will be a blessing to you. And I hope tonight I can set the stage for that. Uh, by looking at just the first few verses. Matter of fact, just verses 1 through 3. And I want to I try to show you the wealth of information that's here if you learn to read carefully. And, the, and that is the key, to read carefully. And as, as you hopefully do a personal devotional time, and you need to take notes. What does this word mean? Uh, how does this relate to other verses in the New Testament? And I think only if we do that will these verses take on the meaning that they're meant to. Uh, because we believe that all scripture is inspired. And, and it is for us. And we must somehow relate what look like different and sometimes divergent strands of revelation into some kind of unified whole. Now, the reason I like these first few verses, it's one of the most powerful Christologies anywhere in the New Testament. Uh, When I hear people say, well, Jesus never claimed to be God or um, uh, the early church never worshipped Jesus. And and those are claims that you get if you read much in New Testament studies. I'm always reminded of these few selected Christologies that particularly the church must go back to as a touchstone. And we must go back to them again and again because we stand or fall on the uniqueness and trustworthiness of Jesus of Nazareth. Friends, this is the hook that hangs the whole weight. Now, these Christologies, there there are several of them. John 1, 1 through 18, powerful, unique, um, Colossians 1, we dealt with just a several months ago. Philippians 2 and Hebrews 1. Now, these are the really big ones. And if we ask the question, who is Jesus Christ? 
And if we ask the question, why is our calendar uh, organized around his birth? And why are there people around the globe in thatched huts, in, in beautiful cathedrals, in every culture, in every country, when the, the sun came up hours ago around the world, people have met in his name, praised him, worshipped him, read scriptures about him. Uh, we've got to answer that, particularly in a secular materialistic culture that more and more, uh, friends, I don't think we're in a post-Christian era. I think we're coming into an anti-Christian era. And the reason for it is very plain. Our modern mentality is there are many ways to God. And we stand up and we say, no, sir, there is one way to God. There is one and only one name given under heaven whereby you must be saved. Now, when we say that, we've got to say it in love, but we have to say it in the face of a society that believes there really are no absolutes in any holy scriptures. That want to relegate really any faith, any faith, to a footnote. Now... If there is a Holy Spirit, first class, since there is a Holy Spirit, we're going to win this battle ultimately. Secularism, just like communistic atheism, cannot last because it gives no hope to the human heart and mind. We're nothing but purposeless, animated, um, non-valid, non-eternal Creatures in a very violent universe. And that, that just cannot hold peace and hope for, for humans who know there is something more, something beyond. So I, I, I give this to you and I, I, I hope it's a blessing. This particular text, I think, is the, the text that John Calvin used to write his uh, book on Jesus Christ. Because what John Calvin did is pick the three Old Testament anointed offices, prophet, priest, and king, and describe Jesus in those three prophetic offices. Now, of course, the word anointed is exactly the word Messiah. And uh, I think this is the text that he used to develop that. It's very obvious. I'll show it to you in just a second. I also think that this text answers... Two of the three reasons why Jesus came. Now, if you ask me, why did, did God come in a human form? What is the purpose of the incarnation? I would give three theological New Testament reasons. Two of them are in this text. Number one, he came to fully reveal the Father. Now, this text is going to jump up and down on that. To see Jesus is to see God. Number two, he came to pay a price that fallen humans could not pay for themselves. This is the substitutionary atonement of Isaiah 53, and it's in this text. And third, though not in this text, is still valid. He came to show us what human beings should be, could be, and one day will be. He is the ultimate example of God's will for humankind. Now, though it's not in this text, it is the third of those three reasons for the incarnation. Now, I want to take just a moment. I hope there are some different translations here. Because King James is the best translation of the first verse of, of this that I've seen. I use a New American Standard. This is the 1970. I want to read mine. Then I want someone who has King James, someone who has the, the New International. And if there's any other translation here, I'd like to read just the first a couple of phrases of this. This is the New American Standard. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers, in the prophets, in many portions, and in many ways. Now, is there an NIV text here? Would you read NIV for me? Okay. Somebody have a, another modern translation? Any of RSV or NEB or any of them? Somebody have King James? Okay. God 
Okay. Now, every one of those translations put God first. Did you notice that? God is not first in this Greek text. Now, the Greek text, the Greek language is an inflected language, which means it does not have to have word order. Now, English is a word order language. You've got a subject, you've got a verb, you've got an object. If you change that, you change the sentence. You change the sentence. But in Greek, because the ending tells you what it is, the noun or the verb or the object, if you want to emphasize something, you put it out of normal order. Normal to, normally to the very front, we call that fronted, or you save it till the very end after all the other clauses. It is not God that's fronted in this text. It is the little phrase in bits and pieces. <laughs> now look at your Bible again. I would say to you, if we read this the way normal English translations do this, God, that is saying this text is about God revealed. That this is a text on God revealed. This is a text about revelation. But this is not a text on God revealed. This is a text on how, how, how does God reveal and it picks up on the Old Testament because this book is a comparison of the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. So in the Old Testament, God revealed in bits and pieces in the prophets. No one prophet has all the picture. No one prophet has the full plan. No one prophet revealed God completely. Now, you know, the Old Testament is just full of different kind of genres, different kinds of literature that must be interpreted in different ways. And one of the problems of Westerners is we take everything literal and everything right at the surface. And, of course, we miss so much truth because we do that. God revealed himself through these beautiful poems. I've often heard people say, and this is a little, a little controversial statement, so don't get too, too tense with it. If Genesis 1 was in the Psalms, we would have no fight over it. And yet I think Genesis 1 is a poetic, structured creation account. It is wisdom literature. Its purpose is to communicate something in a very quick, very simplistic way so that humans could understand who did it and why they did it. And what we've got caught up on is the how and the when. Uh, no. And that's a genre issue. And those beautiful texts on creation, Psalm 104, perfect example of a wisdom literature poem on creation. There are so many of those poems. Uh, a God spoke in uh, uh, wonderful ways like through Jonah, through a personal account, um, th through a person's history. And then, you know, I always get tickled. Ezekiel, holy moly, what a strange dude that is. I mean, he did things. Ezekiel's the kind of guy you would like to hear him speak, but you would not invite him home for lunch. I mean, he is that kind of weird. All these people brought an aspect of truth. In their day, they brought truth, but they only brought it in bits and pieces and in portions. But something brand new has happened in the New Testament. In the New Testament, God has fully and completely, and I would add finally, perfectly revealed himself in a person. Everything we need to know and can know at this point in our, in our existence about God is known in the person of Jesus Christ. So what's going to happen in the next two verses? This author is going to list seven things about the person of Jesus Christ. I hope you'll mark these in your Bible if you don't have them. Because they are very clear that there are seven descriptive phrases to describe the unique incarnate revelation of the one true God. Now follow with me. Verse 2. In these last days. Now for me, the last days have been... Wherever in the New Testament we talk about the last days, the end... From the time of the incarnation... To the time of the second coming, the two comings, is I think what the New Testament talks about, the last days, the end times. And so in this end period, you and I live in this terrible period. It's terrible and it's wonderful. It's terrible because we have the spirit, we have the truth. The new age has dawned in many ways in our lives and experience. And yet we're still caught in the terrible struggle of the old age. 
we're, we still live in, in the struggle of, of, of the conflict began, beginning in Genesis 3. So um, Garden Fee characterizes it this way, one of my favorite authors. We live in the already but the not yet of the kingdom of God. I think when you and I bow our heads, we're in the throne room of the Father. I think we can have intimate fellowship with God even now before death because of Jesus Christ. We can't see him face to face, but we can talk to him. We can know him by faith. We don't see him by sight, which we will one day. But right now, we have that intimacy. The intimacy that was damaged in the fall. The intimacy of Adam and Eve has been restored in the person of Jesus Christ. What a a marvelous, marvelous um, experience. And yet what a terribly tension-filled life of having that kind of new age mentality and have to live in a fallen world. And we live in that. In these last days, he has spoken to us. And I want to watch your translations here. I'm in verse 2. I think it's a terrible mistranslation of NIV, and I bet it's a mistranslation in yours. Now, you've just got to say, well, who's that fool telling me my Bible is translated wrong? Well, now, friends, I'm going to give you the evidence, and you've got to look it up. I mean, you you can't just write me off because you haven't heard it before. You've got to check what I say. Now, my New American Standard does it this way. He has spoken to us in a capital H, his, in italics, capital S son. Now look, look what I'm saying. Look at your Bible. Does your Bible say in his son? Or does it say in the son? Does your Bible have cap, a capital son? That's the question I'm asking you. Now I submit to you there are no capitalizations or punctuations or paragraph divisions in the early Greek manuscripts. So those are all translator committees decisions. This word son has no article. No article. Now, what we're doing is comparing the prophets in the old age with not Jesus Christ, the um, uh, glorified Son of God. That is, we're not comparing prophets and Jesus, the glorified Son, as much as we're comparing prophets in bits and pieces and a family member, a son, someone always with the father. I think I can prove it to you if you just give me a second. Would you look at chapter 3, verse 6? This same thing occurs four times in Hebrews. Chapter 3, verse 6. Here's, here's the verse. But Christ was faithful as a son. My New American Standard, again, makes it a title and makes it a capital S. It is not a title. It, here, it is a category, a family member, a son, 3-6. Would you look over at 5-28? Excuse me, 5-8, 5-8. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things he suffered. Would you look at chapter 7, verse 28? For the law appoints men as high priests who are weak, but the word of oath which came after the law appoints a son. Made perfect forever. It should be a little s, and it should be a, not a capital H. Prophets didn't get it. A son got it. Prophets were bits and pieces. A son, always with the Father. He has fully revealed himself to us. Here is one who was always with the Father. Now, Around Christmas, I get a little nervous. Some of our, some of our, uh, our Christmas cards and Christmas songs just get me nervous. G- Bethlehem is not the beginning of Jesus Christ. He didn't come into existence at Bethlehem. There has never been a time when Jesus Christ did not exist with the Father. Jesus Christ is not a created entity. He is the creator. And I think I can prove that to you. So number one... He has spoken to us now, this new day, this new comparison, in a son. Now, here it starts. Look at the word whom and and kind of the first one. Number one, whom he appointed heir of all things. He's a son, so he's the heir. Now, here's the kicker. Through him, we're sons and we're heirs. Heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. Think about that. I, you know, um, <clears throat> all of us own a home probably or a, a 
piece of land somewhere and we put a fence around it. <laughs> we put a sign. I, I had people drive through my house just to get to the, a restaurant that they built next door to me. So I put a sign up. Private property. Do not enter. Don't mess up my driveway, fool. And you know, um, <laughs> do I own that driveway? Do I own that house? I mean, really, in a hundred years, does anybody going to know a guy named Bob living in that house? Absolutely not. We put fences up and that, friends, we own everything in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Don't be looking for bigger and better. You are a joint heir of the universe, my friend. If, if you want a, a moon on Saturn, you probably will get it. Get over it. We don't need things in this realm. I know in our political structure that ownership and private property is a good thing. I'm not hitting that. But you ought to know that you are far beyond ownership and private property. Jesus is the heir because he's the son and we're joint heirs with him. Number two. And this is what some people really get kind of surprised about. Through whom he made the world. I submit to you based on this and other texts and I am not going to give them to you. Now if you don't have a reference Bible you ought to get one. If you want to see where else the New Testament says this, you look it up when you get home. Amen? If you say, I don't know how, it's time you learned. Every one of these verses has a marginal note that tells you where the same word or the same thought is used somewhere else. Here, I'll submit this to you. It was not God the Father that spoke in Genesis 1. It is not God the Father that knelt down in the clay of the Tigris Euphrates and formed man out of the red clay. Breathe into him the breath of life. The New Testament says that Jesus was God's agent in creation. It is Jesus that made the worlds. It is Jesus. There are several other texts in the New Testament that say that very. As Jesus is the Father's agent in creation, he will be the Father's agent in redemption and the Father's agent in judgment. Number three, verse three. He is the radiance of his glory. Now, I must admit to you, I do not use the word radiance very often. Do you? I mean, I mean even in Scrabble, I don't use radiance. I mean, that's just not a word I use. Um, King James has the word effulgence. Now, I really have never, I don't think I've ever used the word effulgence. Have you? You're effulgent, are you? Well, get over it. Take something. Penicillin may help. I don't know. Um, what are we talking about? Jesus is not the moon that reflects the light of the sun. Jesus is the very particles of light that emit from the sun. He is not the reflection of anything. He is the full-bodied existence of the Father. He is the radiance of his glory. Um, it, it's hard for us to think about that, but everything the Father is, the Son is, is what this is trying to say. Uh, number four, and I, I just love this one. He is the exact representation of his nature. Now, there are two Greek words used for this word exact representation. There's one that's used in uh, 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, uh, Colossians 1.15. It's the word image. He is the image of God. Uh, this is the word icon. Now, you know that our Roman Catholic friends have used that word for the statues of biblical people and saints that are often in their services that remind them of what the biblical story are or, or, or whatever. So it means a representation of, a, a picture of, a model of. But this is not the word icon. This is the stronger word. This is the word character. Now, this is the word, you know, in the ancient world, if you wanted to show something belonged to you, uh, there would be a, a hot wax, and you would put the family signet ring in that wax. Sometimes it would seal something. Sometimes it would just show who, who's it, who it belonged to, the ownership. That wax is the exact representation of the image of that signet ring. Now, what does this mean to us? Uh, being an Old Testament professor, there are some texts that scare me to death in the Old Testament. A God comes across pretty angry, pretty vindictive, and destructive in some text. Uh, we, we think that there are some uh, really bad texts in the Quran that back up the, the view of jihad. Well, friends, where do you think those bad texts like that came from? Uh, much of the Quran is based on the Old Testament. 
And I want to tell you, when, when, when the Old Testament God says to the Israelites, everything in Jericho that breathes dies. Men, women, children, ducks, turkeys, if it breathes, it dies. That's pretty scary. I remember Yusa, when he stood there bringing the cart back, and uh, they shouldn't have brought the, the ark in a cart, it's supposed to be carried by a priest. The cart almost tips over, and Yusa stops the ark from falling out. God takes his life for touching that ark. David is furious. That scares me too. Here's somebody trying to help, touches the wrong thing in the wrong way, and he's out of here. How do I know what God is like? Is he the hanging judge of the universe? Is he just after get you? Is he just the disciplinarian? Is he, what is God like? When we see Jesus Christ loving people who the society did not love, loving the powerless, loving women, loving children, loving lepers, lo- loving those who, who we felt compassion for, widows with dead sons and all the rest, we perfectly see the mind and heart of God the Father. Jesus is the full and complete representation of God the Father. When we see the compassion and love of Jesus, <clears throat> we can trust this is the compassion and love of God the Father. Hallelujah. What is God like? He is exactly like Jesus Christ. Man, that takes a load off. I, I can, I can, I can uh, snuggle up to a God like Jesus. I'm a little nervous about this Old Testament. Of course, it's just cultural in the Old Testament. That's what they did to everybody. So you just got to know that culture and not try to project the things that happened there in, into our era. Uh, the next one, I think it's also powerful. He upholds all things by the word of his power. Now I want to talk just a minute about, and this you got to go back to Genesis. And um, I just got out of Isaiah 55, 11. My word does not go out from me without accomplishing it. Genesis 1, creation comes by the spoken word. If I get to heaven and God says, that isn't the way I really did it, I'm not leaving. (laughs) Now, we call this fiat, you know, that he spoke and out of nothing things came. Fiat ex nihilo, those are the Latin words we use. Creation spoken out of nothing. I'm quite content at this point in my fog, at this point in my lack of full understanding to say, God created by the spoken word. And that becomes a Hebrew idiom for the power of God. God speaks, you can bake it to the bank. How many times Isaiah said, I have spoken, the prophet says. That settles that. That's going to be done. My word does not go out from me. Void. You think it's by accident that Jesus in John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word. There, in the Hebrew thought, there is a power. The word here is not only the word of creation, but the word of sustaining. This is the God that sustains. Uh, This is the God of providence. This is the God that the rain falls on the just and the unjust. This is the God where the, uh, the earth keeps rotating. The seasons keep coming. You can depend on it. A scientific model developed in the Western world, not the Eastern, because of texts like this. There's a regularity in nature. Why? Because God not only created, he preserves it. He sustains it. He is the one that keeps it together. And we would say for the purpose of evangelism and fellowship. So he is the sustainer. Uh, Look at the next one. Number six. When he had made purification of sins. Now, this is kind of a, these first few have been somewhat cosmic in their orientation. Very much like Colossians 1. Cosmic Christ. He is the creator. He is the eternal son. He is the sustainer. All of that has cosmic ramifications. But number six is what, what I would call the, uh, this is the uh, sacrificial model for helping humans in their sin. This is the idea. And it, it, it's said so well by John the Baptist, John 1, 29, uh, talking to Peter and Andrew when he said, Behold, speaking of Jesus, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Now, this is the idea of substitutionary atonement. This is the Isaiah 53. This is the idea that particularly the Day of Atonement is the best Old Testament sacrificial model, I think. The, 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 the other sacrifices have, have a, but, but, but the Day of Atonement is best. Here's these two poor goats. One's going to be ran away, chased off. It removes the sin from the camp. The other's going to die on the altar. Sin takes a life. God in his mercy allowed the sinless one 
to take the guilt and sin of all human beings. It's Hebrew corporality. And um, so here is Jesus as the high priest. Here, and Hebrews is, has a very strange way. Uh, a little later on, particularly in chapter 9, Jesus is the high priest. And Jesus, at the same time, in the same paragraph, is the sacrifice. And he offers it in the heavenly temple. So there, there's a real fluidity between Jesus' as priest and Jesus' as sacrifice. He is both in this book. Here, he is the high priest. When he had made purification for sin, and this is an aorist middle, he himself once and for all. May, that's what bothers me about um, the idea of Jesus dying over and over for our sins. He died once. Friends, you want to do a Bible study, you look up in Cardinals, the word once, O-N-C-E, and look how many times it's used in Hebrews. Once for all, once for all, once for I bet it's used 12 times. In Hebrews, emphasizing what? He died once and he's never going to die again. One sacrifice was adequate for all human need forever. It's done. Friends, we walk in the victory of a finished redemptive deal. <laughs> Everything that needs to be done for the whole world to be saved has already been done. And the only thing that keeps the whole world from being saved is unbelief. Uh, every, Jesus died for the sins of the world. Now, the last one, it, it's, it's number seven. He sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. Now, I would submit to you that no priest ever sits. Now, just a little, a little aside. That's why I do not think we can let 2 Thessalonians 2, where it says the Antichrist took his seat in the temple of God. I don't think we can automatically say that's a Jewish temple. The only temple that had a seat in the first century world was Zeus Olympus, who had a throne. Or oracles that had an empty seat. Uh, not a, never, never does a Jewish priest sit when he's on duty. Never. No, no procedure. There is no place to sit in the Holy of Holies or the Holy Place. So what can this mean here? He took his seat. Friends, this has got to be the kingly part. Uh, th this has got to be the royal aspect. This has got to be the Psalms 2 aspect. So here we have in the last two, the high priest and the royal line of Judah. Uh, th th this going back to those of prophecies um, back in Genesis 49. And then again by Moses that this scepter is in between Judah's feet. And uh, he's going to come and Shiloh's going to come. That's this idea of king. So here he is, prophet. He fully reveals God. Priest. He pays a price that none of us could pay. And king, he sits down at the right hand of majesty. What a savior do we have. Now, friends, I know this is in um, first century imagery, but the truth of this is eternal. This is the issue of Christianity today. Who is Jesus Christ? The rest is peripheral. Who is Jesus Christ? If you come to the conclusion that the New Testament has faithfully revealed that he is God's unique son, the full and complete revelation of deity, the only sinless one who could die on our behalf, then Christianity is true. If he is not, it's just another ism. Just another superstitious ism. Now, I think at some point, all of us must pay the price to do a personal study of who is Jesus Christ. I commend that personal study to you. May we pray. Whenever we look at these texts, Lord, that describe who you are, we're always humbled at the majesty of your preexistence as well as the love and power of your time with us. We look forward, whatever the future may hold, whatever heaven may be like, we look forward to a time that we can be with you and know you at even a more intimate level than we do now. But thank you, by faith, we can know you and trust you. And we can have a sense of peace, even in a world like ours, even in a world where many Christians pay the ultimate Christ for their faith. We thank you, thank you, Lord, for this peace, this God-given peace, this God-given assurance that the Bible is true and that you really...